Hey everybody, this is a film where we're trying to make sense of the information landscape in 2021 and we decided to get a little bit of help from some of the faculty on our online course, Sensemaking 101, people like Daniel Schmachtenberger. I see a huge amount of just lack of agency nihilism. And then insofar as people get engaged, it's almost all with the combination of certainty and sanctimony, which is such a kind of sad combination of things, but like um, moral certainty and epistemic certainty, both of which are unwarranted and just the righteous outgrouping of everybody who disagrees, like, like a feeling of righteousness for saying how wrong they are because those people are polluting the information ecology so badly. And um, whether those people are the terrible Antifas or the terrible Trump supporters or the, like it, it, both sides are doing the same thing in this particular way. Some are, they use different tools and mechanisms. Um, some of them are more effective at it than others. Uh, but the good faith dialogue that leads to new insights on both people's part and that is where it's entered with earnestness and curiosity and openness to kind of co-learn together. Like I, that happens in places like the, the rebel wisdom community. It happens in little bitty pockets, but it's not part of public culture right now, which basically means public culture is uh, a kind of dying thing unless we um, turn that around. And also the cognitive scientist, John Vivekey. I want people to understand reason and wisdom as this capacity to deeply listen, which sounds absolutely trivial and useless, right? But it's, a, it's the idea is, well, no, no, there's a very active, powerful form of listening, and you do it when you're listening to music. So way back at the beginning, Heraclitus said, don't listen to my words, listen to the logos and recognize that everything is one, right? He's trying to get people to learn to listen to the logos in that comprehensive, in both senses of the word, contemplation of reality. And only if we recover that resonance will we recover the power of reason to find it compelling again in a deep and fundamental way. And that's what I'm most interested in right now. And the facilitator, Sarah Ness, who's been wrestling with polarization and division in the classes she runs. What I'm struggling to make sense of right now, aside from the entire world and the environment and like the brain and relationships, aside from that, um, I am really intrigued and worried, um, but also fascinated by the amount of polarization that's happening right now. Um, and not just polarization, but how much each side is like going towards views that have like no um, possibility for deviance. And I'm really curious about the way that our views are getting associated with identity and why there's such echo chambers. And um, it's worrying for my own work because my work is all about like, how do people connect with each other? And so this film is kind of awkwardly poised between a piece of content and a little bit of plug for the course. Um, as you know, almost all of our content is delivered for free. We've got to pay for it somehow. Um, we don't take ads. Watch this, consider coming on the course, but I think there's enough good content in this film anyway, if you just want to watch it for that. Yeah, so we've been talking a lot about the, the fragmentation in the information landscape recently. Like, where, where are you at with it all? What do you make of it? I feel like we're in a really interesting time now in 2021. It kind of feels very confused to me. Like we had so much intensity last year with the pandemic, the information ecology getting really, really fragmented once all of these kind of divisions over what's true and what isn't takes on this sort of like health implications as well. We saw a lot of crackdowns from the big tech platforms. We saw all of these kind of little ecosystems arriving in so many different areas. Um, we covered a lot of the kind of the rise of um, conspirituality, the kind of the new religions of QAnon, the kind of aftermath of the, the kind of Black Lives Matter protests and the kind of groupthink in the media. We covered that a lot in the sense-making series. And there felt like this real intensity leading up to the American election. A lot of us thought that it was going to go, yeah, we kind of thought civil war might be a possibility. We thought things were going to intensify. And Trump was this kind of uniting thing, like pro and against, and everything was seen through that prism of being pro and against Trump. And what I'm seeing happening now afterwards is, is an increased kind of, it feels like a lot of the intensity is lower, for sure. 
but there's an increased kind of fragmentation. And this idea that our friend Peter Lindbergh talks about, these mimetic tribes, the idea that it's not just left against right, it's also kind of divisions within tribes as well. And that's what I'm seeing. When I go on Twitter now, what I'm seeing is a lot of the conflicts are within different tribes. They're within the different kind of... Um, th there's a lot of fissures and fragmentation. It seems like almost infinite fragmentation, like people falling out with each other. You take sort of Sam Harris declaring no longer being part of the IDW. A lot of these kind of fissures are emerging within, within all of these kind of previously coherent tribes. I think possibly because Trump and the anti-Trump is no longer there to kind of keep things together. And so everything seems to be fragmenting, which makes it more difficult to make sense of things, like a lot of the fixed points. And obviously the ideological capture of all the different sides. And in particular, what I find really fascinating and kind of weirdly terrifying is the amount of certainty like that Daniel points to. The amount of certainty among people around things they, they can't be certain about, like medical issues or like at some point you're always judging kind of who can you trust or whose opinion you're, are you going to trust. It always, it often comes down to an appeal to authority. And this is, yeah, it's fascinating and it kind of points to what we've been trying to do at least for the last year, especially since we launched Sense Making 101, is like, how can we make sense together? How can we use the skills of kind of self-awareness, working out when we're being manipulated, when we're being limitedly hijacked, kind of being very aware of that reaction? How can we then kind of look at the different sides of different perspectives? How can we have like a reverse media diet, check out stuff that would normally we wouldn't look at, and kind of have this idea of, okay, how can we really challenge ourselves and how can we use some of the skills of discernment, of mindfulness, of presence, of how do we relate to each other to kind of try and make sense of the information landscape? Well, some people believe stuff because it appeals to particular aesthetics that they have. Some people believe stuff because it makes them be part of an in-group that they really want to be an in-group with. Some people believe stuff because they just like to be disagreeable or because they like to be agreeable and that was the dominant culture they came into or like whatever, all of these biases that affect it. So the first person epistemics is, can I notice as I'm trying, epistemology is about knowing, right? So there's the knowing about the thing that I'm trying to know, how do I do that? But there's also knowing about the knower, what is my own bias in my process of knowing, right? And this, the second person epistemics is not only can, if I'm trying to do this in conversation with, with other people, can I come to understand their perspective? Because there might be some truth in their perspective and what the values are. Can I also understand the way that I'm influenced by the perspectives of the people that I'm around? Um, because of wanting approval and wanting to fit in and wanting to seem smart and not wanting to be outgrouped and those types of things. So there's a lot of like to really get sense making, there's sense making about myself, sense making about the human social world and sense making about the non-human rest of the world. And they, they're they all recursive. They all affect each other. So kind of you either work on them all together or you'll probably just suck at them all. Um, and so what what I really like about the course you guys put together is that it's working on all three of those. There's the, the inquiry into where our, our own biases that mess up our sense-making. How do we get better at communicating effectively and earnestly and listening and in good faith with others to understand where they're coming from and understand how it affects where we're coming from? And how do we do a better job of critical thinking and rationality and observing and um, forecasting, et cetera? And, uh, so it's not personal development just so I'm happier, but it's also not focused on the world pretending like what I bring to it doesn't matter. It's really at the intersection, which is why I have been happy to keep uh, coming and sharing here. And for what it's worth, because a lot of people know that all most of the information has some vested interest behind it, economic or otherwise, um, I don't. I have never received any uh, pay from these courses that you guys offered, but uh, I think the course should be paid for because otherwise 
like you have to have video equipment, you have to produce it, like you have stuff to do. And otherwise you'd need to sell ads. And that would, selling the ads would ruin the whole thing. So I think as long as we still have business as a thing, business should pr provide a good or service that's valuable for people. This is a real service that's valuable. Um, and I think most everyone that's involved is involved more because they actually believe in the mission. Yeah, something that strikes me just looking out my window in 2021, sort of metaphorically, is yeah, certainly a sense of deep fragmentation and, and the sense of almost like a, the image that comes to me is, is um, being in the desert. You know, lots of different mimetic tribes who have, who kind of center around an ideological position very often, um, being sort of distinct from one another, but without anything to bind them. And I do think Trump and Brexit is, is worth mentioning as well. I think these kind of large uh, shifts in, in culture and values and the sort of singular point of focus of either doesn't really matter if it's for or against. There was a kind of unifying factor. And COVID as well was also in a strange way a unifying factor. With those gone, that that's it there's no unifying factor. And I just have this image of of just many tribes not really linked by anything. And I think what's what's important is that we you know we talk about sense making a lot on the channel, which is literally our ability to make sense, figure out what's going on and doing that in a very complex environment. So it's not the same as just mapping out a plan of, okay, well, I know this, I know this, and this is gonna lead me here. That only works if the environment is fairly, um, is staying the same, basically. But we're in an environment where things are constantly changing. You try and grasp one truth, it turns out to be partial. You're like, okay, I've got, I've got to hold multiple perspectives. This is you know, one of the skills we focus on a lot. Um, you know, decentering, which is one of the five facets of mindfulness, which is that ability to take a step back and not be immediately, um, not immediately react to the content of your experience. That's absolutely crucial. If you're reading two different articles with two completely different truth claims and they, you know, contradict each other entirely, it really helps to have that space to go, okay, well, I'm not going to jump to that conclusion. I'm not going to jump to that. You know, that's actually kind of pure academia if you think about it in those terms. So the sense making, that's really key because then we, you know, we can orient ourselves and figure out where we're going and what to trust is a huge thing. But there's also meaning making and something Daniel Schmachtenberger talks about as well. They kind of, they often go together, making sense and then making meaning coherently. And I think there's a huge dearth of meaning making or good meaning making. Um, and I think John Verveke talks about this, you know, really, really well. I mean, this is, you know, probably one of the people who's pioneered our understanding of, uh, you know, what he calls uh, the meaning crisis. The other really big thing is this kind of shared sense, I think, when, when I express it, a lot of people seem to have, is a lack of novelty, like a sense that everything feels like it's a little bit played out. It's a little bit like, we've heard this before, we've heard this before, we know what this person's going to say. Like you find a new person, a new kind of um, podcast host or whatever, and you listen to them for a while, and it's like, okay, now I kind of know what that person's gonna say. And the sort of the lack of, the lack of conversations to take us in a new play, new direction, which I think is partly because we're so walled off in these ecosystems and people are kind of aligned with different positions and no one really wants to budge. And it's very dangerous if you start to kind of shift and then people on your own side start to dislike you, all of that sort of stuff, like all of that sense of where's good faith gone? Like that's a big question. And also where is genuine novelty in terms of going somewhere new, like emergent dialogue I mean, there's, there's not a really good way to describe it. It's what John Bovecki calls dialogos. It's like, how can we enter into a conversation that can go somewhere new? And John has made that the focus of his, of his work. That's what's amazing about, he's, he's really pursuing what is the scientific basis for emergent dialogue. There's all of these different modalities around it, like circling, like um, authentic relating. And if you've had that experience where you're expressing something that maybe you've expressed for the first time and you're expressing, you're trying to articulate uh, novelty, new, a, a new, and to build a new relationship with someone, and learn something as you're speaking and as you're exploring, that's the thing. It's dialogos, and John is basically. We've tried to build the whole course around this experience of dialogos, around this experience of inquiry, and that's what John has really been pursuing in his work. It's now becoming really pertinent to me, and it's sort of the linking question between wisdom and meaning, which is. And I hear people saying this all the time, why can't we listen to reason? And they're usually accusing the other side. Why can't they listen to reason? Why, they can't, why can't they listen to reason? And then the, reason, the reasons that are given are, are usually, I think, myopic or, 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 or incomplete. You know, it's because the other side is stupid or the other side is weak. 
or, or right, or, or the other side is manipulated. Um, and of course, and then there's, you know, wow, there's the technology and all that. But that, that I don't think that's, so that might be sort of how the question sits for us today. But the question that I'm really interested in is the deeper one. And it's, so it's both perennial and pertinent uh, because Plato is asking the question too, as Athenian democracy is entering into significant decline as well. So I thought, oh, um, this is something I, I keep coming back to. Um, and uh, so Schindler has a has a thesis that's very similar to mine that reason has been truncated. And he goes through some of the usual historical suspects that I went through, Luther and Rousseau, and then there's aspects of uh, Descartes. Um, but then I got really interested in this question about, well, what, sometimes we say this, and let's say, let's, let's put aside all the postmodern critiques for a second. Sometimes we say this and we mean it sincerely and authentically. That's a compelling argument. What does that actually, actually mean? What does it mean? And what does it mean for us? And why have we lost that to a significant degree? And so what I'm really interesting, interested in right now is why can't we listen to reason? And not, and I don't want to give the knee-jerk superficial answers because they're actually symptomatic of the very problem that we're trying to address, right? We're getting, no, no we, we, what we've developed is because of Luther and Rousseau and Descartes, we've developed a note, we've, we first turned reason into rationalism. The idea that thinking is just computation. It's just a purely formal system. And I think we've misunderstood the legitimacy of some of the postmodern critiques because the postmodern critiques, I would argue, actually converge with a lot of critiques that came out of 4E cognitive science, which is the problem with computation is it can't capture meaning and it can't capture relevance. And that's, so the postmodern is basically, I mean, this is in Derrida, he think he follows the sewer. He says the language is like a chess game. That's a prototypical formal system. Think about a chess game. The pieces don't have any meaning to the world, they only have a purely formal relationship to each other, and and they and therefore they only have an instrumental value. We just manipulate them however we will, just like how we can program a computer however we will. And so we started to think of ourselves as computers, and then we started to build computers and surround ourselves with computers. And so we've developed this empty, purely formal, purely instrumental, manipulative technical sense of reason. And, though, and so we've identified reason, people are being rational when they're being very much like computers, they're purely logical, purely formal, only, right? And then, and then we said, and, and like a computer, it's just a tool that's at the service of other things. Uh, so and we, we see this like, yeah, what's the point of reasoning? Well, it's, give me the application, give me the bottom line, right? Uh, give me some power over other people or power over the world. And what Plato and Socrates were trying to do uh, uh, Schindler argues, and I think it's brilliant, is they were trying to get us out of that consumptive view of reason, purely instrumental, um, and then back into the communicative. But the problem with the communicative is we can think that the point of reason is to persuade other people. And then they wanted to go back through that to what I would call contemplative reason. And I want to use an analogy here. Instead of thinking of reason as empty, as an empty technical instrument, I want you to think about something we do for its own sake. Uh, serious play, music. So, and notice we are also trivializing music. So there's a strong analogy here. What is it we're doing when we're listening to music? Well, we're seriously playing with our ability to make sense of things. What's the point? What's the bottom line? What's the application? Well, how are we persuade? We're not doing any of that. What we're trying to do is to come into a right relationship with ourselves, with other people and reality. And that's it. We're not trying to do anything beyond that. That's So, right, music has this capacity to bring us into a proper, authentic state of contemplation. And we do it for its own sake. And in fact, we will make sacrifices to be able to get to that place. And then we, that is where, it's precisely because music in, in, a, in, a, in an instrumental sense is absolutely pointless that it has the power to compel us. And we need to recover. We need to learn how to listen to the musicality of being. We need to recover 
reason as this contemplative listening. Notice, right, what you do in music. You, it's, 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 it's both compre it's comprehensive in two senses of the word. You're trying to comprehend it, but you're also trying to get the whole. You're trying to see all the parts in the whole and all the whole in the parts. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. There was an old mythology for this, listening to the music of the spheres. So John Rusin and others have argued, you know, we should remember that intelligibility, right, uh, which is our primary way of being connected to the world, has a musicality to it. And what I want to point to is that part of wisdom, and this is the deeply aesthetic point of wisdom, and I've talked about wisdom as the virtue of being, uh, uh, sorry, as the beauty of virtue, right? Um, I, 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 I want people to understand reason and wisdom as this capacity to deeply listen. Yeah, and this idea of developing relational skills is also like deeply tied to the whole idea of culture war, because I don't see a way through kind of the divisions that we're seeing in society unless we really understand where each other is coming from, unless we really develop empathy and we're able to kind of appreciate what other people's perspectives are. And that's all about relationality. That's all about understanding and being able to really enter into a genuine relationship with each other. Um, also, what I'm seeing happening a lot, because Trump is now gone as this kind of bogey figure on the left and um, is, in a way, I, th I see Trump as kind of a distraction from a civil war on the left that was happening anyway between liberalism and what some people have called like council culture, kind of a new Ill illiberalism on the left. This kind of, and that, that I think was delayed or distracted by, like Trump rode a lot of the wave of dissatisfaction with that council culture, with wokeness, and certainly was sort of able to articulate and push back against it because he just didn't, didn't care, like completely, kind of hack the system in that way. But now that he's out of the way, I think that overdue and very tricky conversation of like, when does, um, when does the left go too far? When does it become cancel culture? When is it a, a, a genuine concern about other people? And when does it become a way of shutting other people down? Which is something that Sarah Ness, I know, has dealt with a lot in her workshops. But now in my workshops, I'm afraid to speak up about anything that might be against the kind of party line. Like if I don't ask people to identify their gender pronouns, it's like, you know, a terrible thing, even though people have different preferences around whether they even like having a gender pronoun. Like some people feel discriminated against if they have to give a gender pronoun and others feel like they don't know whether they want to like buy into the ideology that comes along with gender pronouns. But even having that discussion, I've had a lot of you know, kind of difficulty and um, being seen like as as like a bad person instead of somebody that has a different view. Uh, and so the the it feels like in scientific exchange where you have many different ideas, but you can't talk about what the best idea is. Like there's an article I was reading that talks about how this is showing up in academia and how um, professors or uh, academians who are conservative are like something like 80% less likely to have their papers accepted and to have themselves recommended for promotion now because there's this huge liberalization of colleges and academic discourse. And that completely squashes any sort of kind of back and forth, which is necessary to how we make sense of things. It's necessary to how we debate and dialogue and find the answers. Um, and so, I, and I really don't fully understand why it's happening. Like there are some kind of theories of, well, you know, the internet has made it so we can find more people than ever that identify with our particular views. And so maybe it's easier to have echo chambers because we make that identification. And then like, you know, as more people come into that bubble, it becomes harder to, to break away. Or maybe it's because of like the stress of COVID that, you know, when we're in more stress and trauma, we tend to want clearer um, black and white, like this is right and this is wrong. You can see it even, I think, in the rise of superhero movies and the like, well, we don't want shades of gray, you know, like there is good and there is bad. Um, but I think there has to be like more factors that are involved than that. And it feels like one of the hugest things that scares me right now um, 
because even even in fears that I have, like climate change, if it becomes an identity politics issue, if it becomes part of your identity to think that climate doesn't exist um, or to not do something about it, then like all the academic discourse and all the facts in the world aren't going to change that. Yeah, another thing we focus on is this concept of the shadow. And so the shadow is actually a concept from Jungian psychology, which I found hugely useful just personally and looking at cultural dynamics. So any aspect of ourselves we repress and deny. Um, so we kind of push into the basement of our unconscious. And so we have individual shadows, and we have collective shadows as well. So, and particularly why it's important for sense making is that the dynamic that Jung described is that when you push, cut some aspect of yourself off, what happens is that it needs to be expressed somehow. So you start seeing it where it isn't. You start projecting it into other people. So if you're like, well, I'm never angry. I'm, I'm beyond anger. I'm never, I'd never get angry. No, no, I'm, I'm better than that. When you have a natural anger response, which is a healthy emotion, shut it down, start projecting it outwards. And maybe you think everyone else is angry or maybe you become passive aggressive and everyone who meets you is like, that guy, man, he's so passive aggressive, but of course you can't see it. And what's important is this, the process of learning to integrate the shadow, so learning to kind of bring it back into yourself. And a lot of the cultural dynamics, a lot of the kind of viciousness, contempt that one side has for another, a lot of the inability to have a conversation that's generative, that actually goes somewhere new, is very often because people are talking to each other's projections rather than actually engaging with the person. Um, and uh, Doshin Roshi is one of our faculty, and he's, uh, he's known as the, you know, he's a Zen master, but he's known as the shadow Roshi. He really focuses on the shadow and also bringing in uh, attachment theory, for example. So going into the, the kind of deep psychology of um, what's going on when we're making sense. So we, we asked him as well what, what he's kind of busy with at the moment. It's going to be a very long time before we have such a culture to support individuals on this path, it seems. We certainly don't have one now. And all the wonderful things that Rebel Wisdom doing is it's creating a culture that makes sense out of things. And the postmodern cultures that are so problematic because they are so prejudiced for making meaning and so prejudiced against making sense or liberation from conflict, they're all about creating conflict. This is not going to turn out well, but what can you do? Well, as an individual, I can, I can walk the path of awakening. A culture can't walk a path. A culture can't awaken. Groups don't awaken. Groups just talk about making sense or making meaning or about liberation, but they can't liberate themselves. And we can't see the culture we're in. We can't we can't see the water we're swimming in. It doesn't matter what level it is. So as we all know, we now have access to more knowledge than we've ever had. Uh, it's a bit like having the Hitchhiker's Guide in your pocket, just, just having a phone in your pocket. Um, and so a lot of knowledge is out there for us. Um, and what's rarer is a kind of shared experience. So there's a difference between having knowledge and having experience. I think that's what the value is of a process where we make sense together. And also, yeah, of course, get tuition from, from the faculty. We have a workbook, et cetera, which is really valuable and has all those different models and theories in there, which we've spent a long time curating in such a way and pointing people towards further reading. But again and again, what the feedback tends to be from the course is that shared experience of experimenting with different practices, of actually having the conversation and thinking out loud with your own ideas with another human being who can go, hmm, okay, interesting, tell me more, or yeah, I kind of disagree with that. You can't, well, it's certainly hard to find that in social media, in text-based social media, without it descending into some kind of um, argument. It's incredibly um, useful, powerful, and really nourishing to have that process of engagement and have that um, yeah, that experience of making sense together. And there, you know, in the course, people work in small pods of about, you know, three or four people. Some of those pods are still going long after the first course ended. I think that's a testament to the fact that that, that is rare. It's rare to find that kind of, kind of conversation. And it, it also relies in part in actually learning those practices, which you then take out into your life uh, elsewhere. It's been an amazing journey this has been. And, you know, in the words of like Thich Nhat Hanh, the next Buddha is the Sangha. And I think this is, this is what it looks like. And so, first of all, thank you and everyone for 
helping this magical, um, create this magical space and time for us to think. And thank you so much for those kinds of opportunities, because I don't think there are a lot of us out here who understand what this transformative process is that we're undergoing. And the more that we can understand and appreciate it and practice it, the easier it will be to anchor it individually, collectively, and organically. We all mentioned that the collective sense-making aspect has been in, extremely imperative towards, um, well, in this entire course. I mean, I really hope I can continue to meet uh, many of you and keep meeting with my pod mates for, uh, for, for a long time after this. So thanks for watching, everyone. The next course starts on July 8th, and you can read more about it in the link down in the show notes. And we also have uh, a limited amount of scholarship places, so concession spaces, and there'll be a link for that in the show notes as well. If you can't afford it right now, uh, we don't want that to be a barrier. So just um, get in touch using that form.